All right, guys, the fallout from Kamala's loss the other day continues. Uh, now we have Nancy Pelosi getting involved and not going to sugarcoat it. She absolutely tosses Joe Biden under the bus, but also Kamala Harris under the bus. <laughs> She's basically like, fuck all y'all. Um, you guys all fucked up. And I'm going to break this down for you. So she was speaking to the New York Times. She said, quote, had the president, Biden, gotten out sooner, there may have been other candidates in the race. So this basically confirms that uh, Pelosi wanted an open primary after Biden dropped out, where you have a Democratic convention, where you have all these people vying for it. And basically, at the end of the day, the idea is the party picks the best candidate or who they think is the best candidate. And by the way, you should know her idea of the best candidate was Gavin Newsom. That's who she wants. OK, so uh, she's hiding the ball a little bit here. She's not letting her full position be known that I wanted Gavin. But President Biden dropped out after me and others urged him to. But Biden's last fuck you to the people who forced him out was it was Biden who said, oh, and by the way, it's going to be Kamala Harris. And then, you know, basically at the time, the Democrats didn't want to have uh, a massive fight in the public over this. So you had Obama fell in line. Obama didn't want Kamala either. Pelosi fell in line and everybody fell in line. Right. So she says, um, had Biden gotten out sooner, there may have been other candidates in the race. The anticipation was that if the president were to step aside, that there would be an open primary. And as I say, Kamala may have. I think she would have done well in that and been stronger going forward. But we don't know that. That didn't happen. We live with what happened. And because the president endorsed Kamala Harris immediately, that really made it almost impossible to have a primary at the time. Uh, if it had been much earlier, it would have been different. So in other words, she's saying. You needed to drop out sooner, Joe Biden. So she's blaming him for that. Um, and she's also verifying that Biden uh, went off script when he, after he dropped out, within like an hour, he released a statement saying, yes, it's going to be the vice president. It's going to be Kamala Harris. She's going to be the standard bearer moving forward. Right. And we actually talked about that at the time. And it wasn't just us. Others talked about it at the time, too, that um, that was Biden's last FU to the people who forced him out of the race. His last FU to Pelosi and Obama and the rest of them who wanted Biden to step down. Everybody else wanted an open primary. And Biden was like, OK, fine. Fuck you guys. I'll step down. But if I'm stepping down, I'm going to pick Kamala as my heir apparent. And there's not shit you can do about it. And so that's validation that that conspiracy theory that we all had is actually true. OK, so now let's break this down. Um, so, again, what she's saying here is Biden should have gotten out sooner. Would that have helped? Potentially, yes. Would it have been enough to get whoever the Democrat would be in this scenario over the edge? Almost certainly not. OK, so let's not memory hole the fact that early on when Kamala became the standard bearer, she came out of the gates fucking hot. OK, there was genuine enthusiasm at the time. Then she picked Tim Walls and there was even more enthusiasm. They went with the we're not going back line and the weird line and they... Uh, released some policies that were genuinely good policies, like $6,000 child tax credit. And so let's not do revisionist history and pretend like she wasn't actually super strong early on. And I, I should be clear, my position was I don't want it to just be given to Kamala. Um, but after it was given to Kamala and then she came out of the gates super strong, I was just like, OK, whatever. We have somebody whose name is not Joe Biden, and this is probably going to be as good as it can get. Right. And so like in other words, my position was to agree with Pelosi at the time. But now I feel like she's rewriting history a little bit and pretending like, OK, if Biden got out sooner and then we had an open primary, we would have picked a better candidate and we would have won. I got news for you, Nancy Pelosi. Gavin Newsom in this environment would not have beaten Donald Trump. Pete Buttigieg in this environment would not have beaten Donald Trump. Anybody else you can fucking name would not have beaten Donald Trump. I told this to my audience. I'm sure many in my audience might even disagree with this take. But even if you flip the ticket, I'm Tim Wall's number one fan right? His record in Minnesota is fucking stellar. He delivered for people. But if you flip the ticket and had Tim Walls at the top and Kamala Harris underneath, I still don't think they would have won. So what are they missing? What are these people missing? What they're missing is this is Trump's era, number one. And the last exit to miss Trump's era was 2016 Bernie Sanders. That was the last exit. At the time, it was clear the country's either going to go populist right or populist left. And Bernie was snuffed out by the DNC and other Democrats. And they, you know, destroyed the enthusiasm, the grassroots support for him. I mean, he was like a fucking rock star at the time. You guys remember the whole deal, how they ended up screwing him, right? Both in 2016 and in 2020. 
And since we, lo- we, we missed that last exit, I fear, and I don't want this to sound defeatist because there are things that we can do moving forward, but I fear that um, there was no Democrat in this scenario, whether we had an open primary and they picked a different candidate or they went with Kamala Harris or they went with Tim Walls or they went with fucking Gavin Newsom or whoever, they weren't going to be Trump. They weren't going to be Trump. So what is at the core of Trumpism? I'll make this as simple as possible. People are really, really fucking pissed off and it's a revolutionary era. And anybody who you run who is not a revolutionary is going to lose. That's the lesson from this. And the, the thing about Trump is he's a revolutionary conservative. And Americans will not like the conservative part one bit. They didn't last time he was in office. But they like the revolutionary part. So the way you counter Trumpism is with revolutionary leftism. Right? That's why I say Bernie 16 was the, the last exit before we entered the Trump era. That was how we could have avoided the Trump era. We could have entered the Bernie era, which would basically have been a new FDR era, and we'd be living in a thriving social democracy, and Democrats would have won elections for the next 30 fucking years. Like was the case with FDR. He won the presidency four fucking times and had 80% of the House and 80% of the Senate because he actually delivered for people. So um, that's the thing that nobody wants to admit. People broke for Trump because they're super pissed off and he's a revolutionary. Now, by the way, let me be clear. It's not like the Democrats didn't do some good things. I don't know if you guys can see Stinky, but she's right here. The Democrats did some good things. Biden did some good things. They, they, they did. They did. And by the way, the 2022 midterms were the reward for uh, basically making it a soft landing out of the pandemic. We had a lot of social safety net programs that were expanded and were helping people. We had the extended child tax credit. And this is one of many reasons why in 2022, with Roe v. Wade and the Republicans being crazy, why in 2022 Democrats overperformed. But understand something, guys. Coming out of the pandemic, there is only, this is amazing, there is only one political party in the world where they were the incumbent and they won after the pandemic. So in other words, whoever the governing party was, right wing, left wing, center, whatever, during the pandemic, in most cases, in all but one case, they lost. It was just an anti-incumbency election because people were like, we're fucking hurting here. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough benefits. We can't take care of ourselves. Everything's fucking crumbling. You know who that one was that was able to avoid the anti-incumbency curse after the pandemic? AMLO in Mexico, also known as the Bernie Sanders of Mexico. So in other words, he delivered for people so well materially, right? He gave them uh, much higher wages, much better uh, infrastructure spending. He... He basically is the Bernie of Mexico. That's the best way to put it, right? And he delivered for people. I was just reading an article about it earlier today. And because of that, his party won again, right? So the only way you were going to avoid the Trump era was if Bernie 2016 won. Then there wouldn't have been a Donald Trump era. Wouldn't have happened. Now we have a Donald Trump era. Why? Because he's a revolutionary conservative and people are pissed. They like the revolutionary part of Trump. They do not like the conservative part of Trump. So the way to counter that is revolutionary leftism. Now, the important part here is, though, guys, this is what you need to understand. I just told you Tim Walls would have even won against Bernie this time. Why? Because even though Tim Walls' politics are pretty revolutionary, like he's a social democrat and he actually means it, he presents like more of a technocrat, right? So in other words, he's got the same issue Kamala kind of does where it's like, uh, here's my list of policies and I hope you agree with this and uh, let's, let's try to implement them. And even though they're good policies, they're, they are good policies. Uh, free school breakfast and lunch for kids, paid family leave, paid medical leave, etc. If you present as more of a technocrat elite, you're going to lose. People not only want, they don't only want the substance of revolutionary politics right now. They also very clearly want the style of revolutionary politics. And that's why Trump won. Revolutionary conservative. Completely fucking unhinged, completely authoritarian, completely anti-democracy. Says whatever the fuck comes to his mind. It doesn't care who it offends, etc. And when people look at that, they go, wow, he might really fucking bust up this system and do some new wild shit. Well, I'd like some new wild shit because what's happening right now is not fucking working for me. That's how people feel. And again, Bernie would have delivered because he was a revolutionary leftist. But in this era, guys, and this is the part where I know I'm going to lose some people, but I believe to my core that this is the case. If the Democrats want to win, you need to counter revolutionary conservatism with revolutionary leftism. But in our modern era, you absolutely positively have to 
also have a controversial charismatic celebrity deliver that. The celebrity part is a bonus. It doesn't necessarily have to be a celebrity. But this is why I've been saying John Stewart 2028, right? Because he's charismatic and he's controversial. And he's also a celebrity. So he gets he, he hits all three C's, right? And when you have somebody who's repping revolutionary leftist politics, I'm going to give everybody universal health care. I'm going to give everybody universal basic income. You know, you go down the list of the things uh, that... And there's more of a gut punch with those things, too, compared to, like, a child tax credit. It's a wonderful policy, but it sounds like, oh, really? Tax credit is, like, revolutionary? No. These are real big, bold changes. Universal health care, universal basic income, end all the wars, make our infrastructure number one in the world, right? That sort of, like, definitive way that Trump talks, where there's no ambiguity. We're going to make America great. It's going to be fucking amazing. It's going to be wonderful. You never get, You've never seen anything like it. You're going to be saying this guy is the best guy in the world. It's like a simplistic, childish way of talking, but it worked. So counter-revolutionary conservatism with revolutionary leftism, but bring it in the package of a funny, controversial, charismatic celebrity, right? And that's why I said, again, even if you flip the ticket, and I love Tim Walls, I'm his number one fan, but I don't think he would have beaten Trump. Because, and guys, final point, final point. If you look at the, pol the list of policies, this is an article I read the other day is incredible, right? Uh, this was in The Guardian. Somebody did a poll. And they found that um, in a blind test, 80% of Americans preferred Kamala Harris's policies to Donald Trump. 80%. So in other words, this wasn't really about policy, right? I wish it was just about policy. It's not just about policy. That used to be my whole argument is that everything's policy all the time, period. No, the Democrats are objectively a million times better than the Republicans on policy. Biden is objectively a million times better than Trump was on policy, comparing those their two terms. It's not just about policy. It's about countering a party that throws red meat to their base all the time, all day, every day. Presents revolutionary conservatism so much so that it's openly authoritarian, right? How do you counter that? You counter that with revolutionary leftism. With the added charismatic, controversial celebrity angle, which gets people's attention. Look, I've always been the type of person to, the, to defend the public, right, and say, look, the American people are smart. I don't want to hear any bullshit. I hate that Bill Maher argument of, like, the people are stupid except me, okay? But we also have to be honest with ourselves that this is the fucking social media era. This is the YouTube era. This is the TikTok era. People's attention spans these days are fucking nanoseconds, okay? It re they really are. People can't focus. They got a million things going on in their lives. They're, it, you know, what's going to get their attention? Something that's fucking entertaining, Something that's undeniably entertaining. And Trump provided that. If you, if you just have like, who would you rather listen to talk for an hour, Trump or Kamala? Even ardent Democrats will be like, yeah, I probably want to watch the Trump rally more just because there'll be stuff to make fun of, but also it'll be fucking entertaining, right? It's the same thing. We need to mimic that on the left. We have to mimic that on the left. So uh, I should point out the part of Trumpism, see, this is what's driving me crazy. Maybe I'll do a separate segment on this, maybe not. But the part of Trumpism that now uh, I'm seeing people in cable news mentioning, what they're saying is, bro, you know how we got to copy Trump? We got to be even worse on immigration. We got to go full fascist on immigration. And also, we need to stand up and say with our whole chest, fuck trans people. This is what the Democrats are saying right now. And bro, that is not the answer. The answer is not to say, oh, I'm just going to ideologically now copy the guy who won. This isn't about ideology. It's not about ideology. It's not about policy. It's about a feeling. It's about a sentiment. The feeling and the sentiment is, fuck the system. This guy's a revolutionary. I don't even care that he's a revolutionary conservative, which is worse. I don't even care. The fact that it's revolutionary, I'm going to go in that direction. Well, for the love of God, he throws red meat to his base and ended up winning moderates and independents and people from every demographic group. You throw red meat to your base, Democrats. You need to throw red meat to your base. You need to do revolutionary leftism with a charismatic, controversial face on it or continue losing or continue losing. And what will they probably do? They're already marching off the plank of Trumpism. In other words, their idea is, oh, forget even basic resistance like we did last time. Now we're going to say, hey, I agree with Trump on issue A, B, C, D, and E. Do you like me more now? You're about to find out the Democratic base is going to say, fuck you when you do that. You are not him. You are not him. And pretending it's an ideological thing, and that's why they supported Trump. Are you fucking crazy? He was talking about Haitians eating cats and dogs. He was talking about Arnold Palmer's cock. He was talking about Mike Tyson getting in the ring with Kamala Harris. You think it's about policy? It's not about fucking policy. Jesus Christ. So anyway, look. Back to Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> so Pelosi, 
Um, she's trying to rewrite history a little bit here and say, look, if you had gone the way I wanted, maybe things would have been different. I would have preferred going the way Pelosi preferred. I would have preferred an open primary system. I would have preferred potentially a different candidate from Kamala. But it wouldn't have mattered. It wouldn't have mattered. And Kamala herself, she's also underselling that she ran an okay campaign given the constraints that were put upon her, right? She really did. But you ran up against an absolute behemoth. And literally anybody who even codes like a technocrat. Tim Walls is a fucking populist, but he codes like a technocrat. He would have lost. He would have lost. Just like Kamala lost. Just like Gavin Newsom would have lost. Just like any of them would have fucking lost. The last exit before the Trump era was Bernie 2016. We missed that exit. Now we're trying to pick up the pieces and clean it all up, right? And you have to learn the proper lessons. You have to learn the proper lessons. The proper lessons are you counter revolutionary conservatism with revolutionary leftism. And the only trick of the Trump era that you incorporate on your side is somebody who's controversial and charismatic to lead it at the top. Stop running away from controversy. I'm sorry, in today's day and age, controversy is a positive. I don't care if everybody and their mother are shitting on you. They're talking about you. And for every person you're getting who's pissed off you, you get another one who's super psyched to go vote for you, right? Trump was able to galvanize and motivate so many people to vote. But every time he's in the news, it's some fucking psychotic thing he said. It didn't matter. Because controversy sells and it works. This isn't 1983 anymore. You don't have to avoid anybody ever saying a negative, a negative word. How awesome would it be if you had a, a Democratic candidate who, in the, you know, the first debate, they're like, it, again, let's say John Stewart, because he's the ideal one to me. But he goes up there, he's like, I don't think any billionaire should exist. I think we should abolish billionaires. <laughs> and then what'll happen? All the people all throughout media will be screaming, and oh my God, did he go too far, this, that. Let them bitch, let them whine, let them moan. They are talking about you. And for every person who's like, oh, that's gone too far, you'll have three others who are like, fucking based, where do I go vote for this guy? So anyway, um, it's going to drive me crazy the more I see everybody's reaction to this election, because I don't, I've hardly seen anybody who's gotten it exactly right. The people who are closest to correct are the people who are saying, hey, Bernie was right about everything. Like, that's the closest to being correct. But even they're missing something. It's not just give me a Bernie Sanders style politician. Give me somebody who's right on all the policies. It is that plus the revolutionary aesthetic and the revolutionary aesthetic. Bernie had it to some extent, right? But in today's day and age, it's got to come in the package of a controversial, charismatic person and hopefully even a celebrity because those three things will keep Americans' attention and will keep their name in the news and will effectively counter the fucking psychos on the right. So we're, we're ready for a dogfight, man. We're knuckling up. But guess what? As we're talking about a dogfight, what are the Democrats doing? They're going, hey, shit, maybe we should just agree with Trump from here on out. Oh, boy. <laughs> Get ready, man. It is going to be a long four years.